Today we're micromachining glass and we're doing it with a relatively straightforward protocol and you guessed it, a laser. In this case, it is a pulsed laser of higher power than the ones we've seen on the channel so far. But despite that, it's still a very easy process and you can get pretty impressive results on a material that's traditionally pretty hard to machine. The process is known as laser induced backside wet etching which is a bit of a mouthful. But basically the idea is you take a glass slide, you stick it down in a solution, shoot a laser through the slide, and the solution itself causes the etching or machining process to happen. I accidentally stumbled on this process a few videos back when I was working on the copper deposition project. I was playing around with the copper sulfate solution and then later kind of a graphite like I use for the electroplating. And I discovered that if you got the parameters just right, you could get some pretty controlled etching of the glass slide. Now the etching was very crude and rough and it had a lot of brittle fracture breaks and small micro cracks all over. So it wasn't a particularly good demonstration of the process, but it was enough to get me researching to figure out like what is this process? Because surely I wasn't the first one to discover it. And sure enough, I wasn't. Laser induced backside wet etching is essentially what I stumbled upon. For this project, I built a little plexiglass test chamber. It's really janky and ugly, but it gets the job done. You fill it with solution up to these two posts, place a slide in top, and then you fill it just enough so that the solution makes contact with the slide and you can shoot a laser through. And I did it out of plexiglass, predominantly so I could get high-speed footage of it looking through the front. At the heart of this process is a solution that absorbs the laser light that you're working with and it essentially vaporizes the solution and forms very small pockets of plasma and the plasma is what etches the glass. The literature shows a wide variety of different solutions. Basically anything that absorbs the laser will work fine, but often people use copper sulfate because it's simple, cheap, effective, and relatively non-toxic. Right, so let's dig into the details. As I showed before, the test setup is this plexiglass box that has two risers in the middle to hold a glass slide. The Really the only important thing about this container is that the glass slide needs to be placed face down, just touching the surface of the liquid. This face down setup is important because the solution absorbs the laser light. So you can't just put the slide at the bottom of a container and fill it with liquid because the laser would be attenuated pretty quickly trying to pass through all the solution to get to the slide. So instead we put it upside down so that the laser goes through the glass slide and is focused right at the interface between the glass and the solution so that the maximum amount of energy is absorbed right at that interface. Okay, so we focused the laser at the interface between the glass and the solution. What happens next? Like how is this actually etching the glass? There's still some debate in the literature how this works exactly, but the generally accepted mechanism of action here is that the laser pulse hits the copper sulfate solution and vaporizes right at the interface between the glass and the solution. This forms a little vapor bubble around the energy pulse, and inside this bubble, a few interesting things happen. The copper sulfate decomposes into elemental copper and various copper oxides, as well as other byproducts like sulfur gas and H2O and some of this copper will adsorb onto the surface of the glass slide. On its own, this doesn't really do a whole lot. There's not enough energy in this bubble or the laser pulse to really do any machining. Temperatures aren't high enough, and it's mostly just a bubble of vapor, and so it's, it's not going to affect the glass. However, things start to get interesting when the second laser pulse shows up, because we have a very different environment than we did just a moment before. We have a vapor bubble that's filled with vaporized copper sulfate, copper oxide, sulfur gas, and inside this bubble, some of the copper has adsorbed onto the surface of the glass. So rather than meeting a bunch of liquid that can very quickly dissipate the energy and form a bubble, we already have a bubble that's acting as an insulator, preventing heat from escaping. And on top of that, we have vapor and adsorbed copper on the surface, which heats up much quicker than the copper sulfate because it's copper oxides. And so this is the mechanism of action that actually etches the glass. The secondary pulse of laser light will hit those oxides and generate plasma on the surface of the glass and inside the bubble. The literature shows that the temperatures inside this laser-induced plasma bubble can reach in the excess of 1300 degrees Celsius, which is more than hot enough to melt any glass that's touching this little plasma bubble that forms. During the formation of plasma, this converts even more of the copper sulfate vapor into copper oxides, which then adsorb onto the hot, temporarily molten surface of glass, which means that 
subsequent laser pulses in the same location before the bubble has a chance to collapse will generate even more plasma and generate more heat and more fracturing and give you more machining. And so this is fundamentally how the process is thought to work. Now it's not a particularly fast process. The literature shows that it is under 10 microns for every laser pulse. And in most cases it's under a micron taken off the surface of the glass. However, that said, it can go into thermal runaway very, very quickly if you get enough oxides that build up in one location and too much laser energy in that spot. And during my tests, I broke many slides and blasted holes straight through the glass in under a second where it's machining just fine. And then immediately you hear this kind of runaway process and you have a hole straight through the glass. So the recipe I'm using adds phosphoric acid into the copper sulfate solution. On its own, the phosphoric acid doesn't really do anything. It hangs out in solution as orthophosphoric acid. It doesn't react with glass. It doesn't react with the copper sulfate. It basically is just another component floating around. But at 200 degrees Celsius, orthophosphoric acid will turn into pyrophosphoric acid, and pyrophosphoric acid will react with glass. This pyrophosphoric acid reacts with the surface and will form a silicon phosphate layer on the surface of the glass. And what's interesting about this is the silicon phosphate layer acts as a sort of protective shield against copper oxides adsorbing onto the surface. And so if you have silicon phosphate on the surface, you don't get as much or any copper oxide, depending on how much has been reacted. And the cool thing about this technique is that the ortho to pyrophosphate reaction happens at 200 degrees Celsius, but the decomposition of copper sulfate into copper oxides happens at 600 or higher degrees Celsius, which means when you have a laser pulse and you generate some of the plasma, orthophosphoric to pyrophosphoric reaction happens before the copper oxides have a chance to form, which means you get basically a very quick effect of protecting the surface of the glass, forming a bunch of oxides, generating more plasma, and etching, but not etching so much that you blast a hole through the glass. And so it's kind of a self-limiting process that slows down the etching rate. The paper I'm referencing managed to machine features as deep as 500 microns in very high aspect ratio, essentially single channels, several microns wide, but 500 microns deep. I don't know how deep my features were. I don't have any good way to measure this. My features are definitely deep enough that you can feel it, although I was not really patient enough to let the process run for a very long time to see how deep I could actually go. Hey everyone, quick editorial note from future me. Uh, it was bothering me that I couldn't quantify how deep these etchings were going. So I thought about it for a little while and I decided to try out these thin cover slips that I have. They're 0.16 millimeters, 160 microns, and sure enough, if you hit them with five or six passes under the right settings, you can etch straight through and essentially cut shapes out of the cover slip. Uh, they're regular float glass, so they're really fragile, so complex shapes tend to break it, but I can definitively say that the etching can go at least 160 microns deep. Another thing I discovered totally on accident, I was trying to get a good thumbnail photo for this video, and I <laughs> think I accidentally made some fiberglass. So I was etching the circle, and I noticed this white fluffy cotton material coming out the top as the etching was getting close to breaking through, and this is a regular borosilicate slide. Uh, and I poked it with some tweezers and pulled it off, and I'm pretty sure it's basically melt-blown glass fibers. So you can see them start to come out as the etching proceeds again. And yeah, I can't think of anything else it would be, so I made fiberglass, which is kind of cool. Okay, back to the video. This footage was captured at 30,000 frames per second. You can see the glass at the top of the frame, and the bluish liquid is the copper sulfate. The laser is configured to do four pulses per point, pulsing at 40,000 times per second. That means pulses are spaced about 25 microseconds apart, and for reference, the 30,000 frames per second means that each frame is 33 microseconds apart. So we're not seeing every pulse, and it's important here to note that the flashes of light you're seeing are not the laser pulses. These are between 10 and 20 frames apart, meaning that those are not actually the pulses of laser. Those are small plasma bubbles forming inside the liquid. It's interesting to note that this doesn't always happen at the same spot. It takes a certain amount of time before the conditions arise under these parameters for a plasma bubble to form. And it's also interesting to see that they don't always form at the surface of the solution either. 
If we look at one of these explosions in detail, we can see that the plasma forms in about two frames, and then a bubble is generated, which expands very quickly in another two frames, imploding a few frames later. And if you look closely, you can see a little bit of debris in the liquid where it's impossible to know really what this is, but some of it is probably some glass and some of it is probably copper oxides floating around in solution now. And if we increase the pulse per point up to 10 pulses per location, we start to see more frequent bubble formation, which is sort of what you'd expect if the theory of this vapor bubble turning into plasma actually holds true. Now it is fun to crank up the laser and see what happens when you give it a lot of power. And unfortunately the explosions were just too large to capture at the resolution, the limited resolution of 30,000 frames per second. So I dropped it down to 20,000 frames so we get a slightly wider field of view and you can see that the explosions are pretty impressive and very violent you'll often form bubbles well under the surface of the glass, as well as what I kind of call vapor channels, where you see a vertical channel of presumably vapor that's being formed by this extended pulse of laser. Now, I don't really know what's happening here, but my suspicion is that the laser pulse has enough energy that it's not depleted right at the surface like the prior pulses at lower energy, and instead travels some ways into the solution, leaving behind a channel of vapor behind it. And this channel, I think, is what leads to more explosions under the surface of the liquid, because there is this uh, low resistivity channel, if you will, that allows bubbles to form deeper in the solution and generate plasma further away from the surface. So let's zoom out and see what happens at a wider scale. Unfortunately, to get a wider resolution, we have to drop down to only 5,000 frames per second. And it's important to note that the bubbles we were seeing in the very first set of videos that were forming and collapsing in two or three frames, only say 50 to 100 microseconds, you just can't see that at this speed anymore. It's gone before the frame has even registered it. So what we're seeing here are only the large pulses of plasma flashes and any very large bubbles that happen to form, particularly those that form pretty deep. This video is a relatively gentle machining. So this is back to about four pulses per point at a modest speed and a modest amount of power. And you can see that most of the flashes are happening near the surface, but there are still a pretty respectable number that are happening below the surface by quite a ways. And by below the surface, this is probably a couple millimeters at the most. We're still looking at this with a 4x objective lens, so we're still pretty zoomed in. And in contrast, this is a run with 100% power, giving as much juice as we can into the system. And you can see we're just rapidly blasting bubbles down into the bottom of the solution, and very few of them are actually contacting the surface. Although I'm sure there are a lot of little micro bubbles that are happening, we just can't see it. And so this is a very clear example of too much power being injected into the system, but it does look really cool on the high speed, I have to admit. There are a lot of other variables we can play with, so I played around with the pulse repetition rate. So my laser can't change the duration of each pulse. That's stuck at about 5 to 10 nanoseconds per pulse but you can change how quickly the pulses are delivered to a particular lo location. Here we're at 80 kilohertz and you can almost see kind of the formation of, maybe not a bubble, but a growing region of hot liquid. I'm not really sure how to classify it, but you can see something growing under the targeting laser, which then occasionally explodes. And this process repeats from the very fast pulse rate of the laser. On the flip side, we can slow it down and drop down to 20 kilohertz, which allows more time in between pulses, but each pulse will deliver more energy. And you can see a very different behavior here. Each set of pulses immediately ignites the location and forms a plasma bubble.
If you like this kind of content, making janky test chambers and blasting holes through glass slides, go ahead and subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. If you'd like to see a little bit behind the scenes of the projects I'm working on, I have a lot of different things in flight at various stages of being ready to share, and I've been posting those to Twitter, the link's down below, and we also recently started a Discord channel for people to chat about projects that everyone's working on and just crowdsource help, so that's also down below. Come hang out, it'd be a lot of fun. Okay, well I think that's all I have for you today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.